So it's my pleasure. I get to introduce Mr. No, I'm just kidding. I get to introduce Josh Sousa to you, who, who I had to introduce just a little bit more for first service because they weren't as familiar. But most of us here remember Josh and Danny because they're with us every Sunday almost when they're not speaking for missions. Right, And so they were with us for several years as our worship leaders, and we were so honored and thankful for your service and for giving your time while you could. And now we understand that you are giving it full-time for missions, because that is our heart too. So awesome. But Josh and Danny are amazing people who have been with MSU Chi Alpha. And yes, go, go. It's okay. <laughs> I'll let you. And then now they are going to launch a brand new Chi Alpha in Indiana. Brand new baby Chi Alpha. It's so exciting. So I'm going to let him come tell you all about those things. And then at the end of service, you will have an opportunity to give and invest in this ministry. So without further ado, give it up for Josh Sousa. Thank you, Melissa. Well, let's get, let's get a couple things squared away. Um, this awesome cheering section here from Missouri State. They're here for Zach, not for me. So let's be, um, like, they heard Zach was getting baptized. As a matter of fact, I walked in and they saw the mic. They're like, are you preaching today? Like, yeah, I, I actually go to church here, you know, and didn't even know, you know, whatever. Um, man, we love Brighton Assembly. Um, we were, kind of quick testimony how we got into Chi Alpha, because some of you don't know this. So I'm from um, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, youth, I was a youth pastor and then church planner out there and was there just about 13 years with our church plant. Never thought I was going to leave. I thought I was there forever. Um, when you plant a church and you help disciple some of the people and you invest in their lives, you just think you're going to never leave, you know? And... Um, we just had an opportunity where we started hanging around college students more. My wife was an adjunct professor at a Christian school there in Indianapolis. And uh, Andy Estrella, who's no stranger to this church, right? Um, he's famous here, right? He's famous everywhere because he's the most extroverted person alive. But he's also like maybe the only Hispanic person that goes to church here. So like, you know. So, you know, and, and that's, not, that's not making fun of anything. I mean, like, there's just not a lot of Dominicans living in Brighton, Missouri. That's just a fact. So, uh, but we met each other as freshmen in Bible college and became the best of friends. And um, he uh, was inviting me to start to speak at Chi Alpha retreats. And so the more we got around college students, the more we were like, man, this, something comes alive in us when we're doing this that's different than when we're pastoring. And I don't know what it is, but maybe it's just a, a niche thing, you know, an itch that we can scratch. And then, but we'll just keep pastoring. And then we were at an event for their fall retreat, and we were in Conway, Missouri. And uh, I went out to a, a small creek there. Uh, we actually, our students call it Dead Deer Creek. Because one year we went to go baptize students, and there was literally a floating dead deer carcass in the creek. And, and we're like, oh, guys, we understand if you want to get baptized. They're like, let's get baptized, Dead Deer Creek, Dead Deer, you know. <laughs> it became a thing. Um, and I was at Dead Deer Creek, and I was just kind of doing my morning devos by myself, just me and the Lord. And I felt like the Lord said, hey, prepare yourself. I'm about to change everything you know about ministry. And at that point, I was still thinking to myself, okay, um, I had been in a journey on what does it look like to do evangelism, when you're not gifted for it. Because um, I'm not a naturally gifted evangelist. I just want to be honest with you. I'm one of those people that when I was in youth group and my youth pastor would say, you know, when you go to school tomorrow, you know, you could stand up in the cafeteria on the table and announce Jesus. I was like, I'd rather die. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't want to ever do that, right? Um, I've rarely ever struck up a conversation with anyone on an airplane. I've heard a lot of those stories. Um, like, that's not really me. And at the same time, I can't escape the fact that God, God tells every one of us that we're supposed to go do the works of evangelism. Yeah. And I'm like, so how do I do that when I'm not gifted for it? And the Lord was taking me a journey. And, and uh, as a result of that journey, I wrote a book about that whole experience. Okay, And we're actually selling it in the lobby today. It's called Living a Questionable Life. And um, they, it retails for $12.49 on Amazon. If you buy it today, it's only $10. Okay. But here's, here's more why I want you to have this as a resource. It's very helpful. But secondly, the proceeds 
go to benefit Chi Alpha missionaries that don't have the networks to help them raise the support they need to get on the field. We have an organization within Chi Alpha called the Minority Mobilization Fund. And so the, a lot of the proceeds of this book go to the MMF. They're not going to us. Um, you're going to help missionaries get on the field if you buy this book. So I encourage you to go get it. But through this process, I thought what the Lord meant by changing everything I knew about ministry meant I was going to walk our church through a different way of doing evangelism. I, I was contextualizing it to where I was at. So I got excited, right? And I decided to hike back from the creek to our cabin. And um, I go to the cabin and I'm like, Danny, she could tell, like, I got something to tell her. I'm just burning to tell her what I just heard the Lord say. And she's like, hey, I need to talk to you. Um, I had a dream last night and the Lord was speaking to me prophetically. And what he told me um, in this dream, like in the dream I was pregnant. And I was like, no, that's not from the Lord. <laughs> it's not from the Lord. We already have enough kids. And on top of that, we have surgically handled not having more kids. So it literally would have to be a miracle. Um, and she's like, no, it's not a natural thing. The Lord said that we're about to birth something new in ministry. And I was like, okay. So like literally within minutes, there's like the Lord speaking to me, the Lord speaking to my wife. I'm like, okay, God, you're up to something. Um, and again, it's about our church. That's what I'm thinking. And then Andy um, comes and has a talk with me. And he says, listen, you are perfect for Chi Alpha. And I want you to consider doing this. And um, I'm like, yeah, man, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Like, I, I love my church and that kind of stuff. And he's like, as my friend. How many of you know when someone puts it like that? <laughs> it just feels weightier, right? <laughs> like, as my friend. <sighs> Heavy, right? He's like, would you pray about at least pray about whether or not you should do this. And I said, because you're my friend and because of the relationship we've had, I will commit the month of October to praying and fasting over this. Now, I don't think I ever told you this, Andy. I literally, like I said that, and I was going to do that. But what I knew at the time was that the way Assemblies of God U.S. Missions works is you can't be a missionary with a certain debt threshold. And because my wife graduated from AGTS and it was expensive, um, we had more debt. And so I knew when I told you that I'd pray about it, I was pretty confident it was going to be a no. <laughs> because I was like, we have too much debt, so I'm not even worried about the Lord saying yes. Um, and, and honestly, the way I work, the relationship God and I have, I go, God, if you want me to do something, it's your problem to solve, not mine to fix. Like, if you want me to do this, you'll erase my debt. I'm not going to go develop a debt strategy to make sure I end up a missionary. Because that's me trying to make it happen. Does it make sense? You want me to be a missionary? You got to make this happen. And so literally within two weeks, long story short, someone calls and asks about our school debt. It was kind of a personal question. And said, the Lord wants me to write a check for, and it was to the penny. And I'm not saying, like, you know when people are like, I feel like the Lord told me to write a check for like a hundred bucks. It's like a round number. It was like, this many dollars and 17 cents. And what he didn't know is that was the exact amount we had to pay off to pay off one of our student loans and put us under the debt threshold to be missionaries. And, and he says, he says um, I thought it was crazy. And it was a large number. I just want to tell you, we're not talking hundreds, we're talking thousands. And it was such a large number that he's like, that couldn't be the Lord. And so he went to go talk to his wife and he said, hey, I was praying for Josh and Danny this morning and the Lord began to speak to me, and she interrupts him and says, to write them a check for X amount of dollars and 17 cents? And he was like, oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> and so then I confirmed that that was true, sent us a check in the mail. We're like, Lord, I mean, burning bush, you could, but we get the message, right? <laughs> we announced to our church that God was calling us to be missionaries at, at, to Chi Alpha at Missouri State University. And... I was told at our support raising training, the amount of money we had to raise, we needed at least a year or more to raise it. And I said, well, that's not going to work for us because we've already announced to our church that we're leaving. And we put together a strategy to replace us, and it's going to take six months. Our support raising trainer, who had been a missionary for years, looks at us, and I'm ready for him to fill us with faith. And he says, to raise that amount in six months is going to take an act of God. 
And I just looked at him and I said, well, God called us. He's going to make it happen. And in five months, we were at full budget. So we left our home church, moved out to Missouri, and have been doing Chi Alpha since. And it has been amazing. Literally, I tell, I tell my friends back in Indiana, they're still pastoring churches where we pastor together in the community. They're like, do you, like, because they don't really know what we do. Does that make sense? A lot of pastors are like, I think you just kind of hang out with college students, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it's so much more than that, right? Um, like, do you, like, are you happy? I'm like, happier than I've ever been in my life. I'm living out my purpose, my calling, you know? And um, so it's been amazing. I love what we do. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing here in a few moments. Um, but I do have an assignment, and I want to get into the, the message this morning. Just a quick couple introductions, and then we're going to get started. Uh, I want to introduce my wife, of course. Danny is the love of my life. Um, she's amazing. And she's awesome. Our Chi Alpha students know how important she is to me. Um, literally. I'll cry if I talk about you. So, and then really blessed to have Ben and Anna Richner here. Ben and Anna have, have been raising our Chi Alpha, and uh, they are going to be going with us when we go to Pioneer. They're moving with us, and so uh, we're excited. They're family to us. Ben lived in our house for, for a year, and uh, we got to disciple him and Anna out of our living room, and it was amazing. And so, uh, but we're excited to be here this morning. So, would you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16? And as you're turning there, how many of you know that there's things you can hear about pertaining to an experience, but you don't really understand it until you're in it? Come on, are you with me this morning? Right? So for example, I'm a city kid, okay? I grew up first 13 years of my life in the Northeast, New Bedford, Massachusetts. I tell people you never heard of it unless you read Moby Dick, right? Uh, but John's heard of it because you're from the Northeast, right? Okay. All right. I wondered, the, the Sunday I came, Super Bowl Sunday, and I saw you repping Brady, I was like, oh, he's a, he's a New England guy, right? Um, but yeah, grew up in the Northeast. <laughs> what? <laughs> you. Okay, yeah. Um, so it's hard to argue with rings, right? That's, I mean, what can you say? Um, so we left Massachusetts when I was 13, relocated to Indianapolis, Indiana for my dad's job, and then that really became home. And, and the truth is that the Midwest is my home. But when I first moved to the Midwest, there was a couple things that I was like, I didn't know until I experienced. So I had heard that people in the Midwest eat things that we never even heard of in the Northeast. And I didn't realize that was true until I moved here. So for example, first time you go to a restaurant in New England, if you ask for hash browns, uh, we don't get these shredded things that you guys eat, right? You get what you all call country potatoes, which are diced potatoes, which is what I expect to get when I ordered hash browns at a diner in the Midwest. And when they brought me these shredded things, I was like, what is this? I don't even know what this is. Is this potatoes? Like, I don't, right? And then they're like, oh, you know what's really good with this is biscuits and gravy. And I was like, we had, there's no such thing as sausage gravy in New England. Nothing. That nothing like that even exists. And so when people say biscuits and gravy, you're thinking like Thanksgiving gravy on a biscuit. You're like, that's foul. Who would eat that? And they're like, it's nothing like that at all. Instead, it's like this weird concoction of what we call cement, <laughs> right, loaded <laughs> on a biscuit. Because if there wasn't enough carbs in a biscuit, let's give it some more. Let's soak it in dense flour paste and hope you can have a productive day. And listen, like, and um, anyone ever been to Naomi's in Willard? Yeah. Naomi's Cafe? I went there one time, and, and they were like, have you ever had our biscuit and gravy omelet? I'm like, what is that? She's like, it's a three-egg omelet filled with crumbled biscuits and gravy and shredded cheese folded, covered in more gravy and cheese. And literally, the guy I'm with, his name's Josh Solomon, he goes, bro, that's like a carb bomb. And then she goes, oh, and it comes with a double order of hash browns. <laughs> I look at him and me, I'm like, bet you can't eat one. Because I knew he was going to feel terrible if he did, right? So like, 
you don't realize things in the Midwest until you're here, right? And then, now that I was in the Midwest, I thought I was prepared when we moved here to Willard. But again, although I lived in the Midwest in Indianapolis, I was in the city. Lived in the city in an urban environment. And then we moved to Willard. And it was the first time in my life I had walked out my front door and smelt cows. First time I'm like, what is that? Got like, you know, acres and acres of just pasture behind our house. Um, or we, uh, we came to church. And I had always told our congregation as pastor, I'm like, when you're looking for a new church, go to a church, give it at least three weeks, because that might be the best or the worst sermon you've ever heard. See what it's like consistently. And then visit a couple other places, pick the best one that fits your family, right? So we were going to do the same thing. Our very first Sunday in town, we visited Brighton. And the first people we met were the Vaughns. Okay? And I'll never forget, we were sitting right here in the balcony, right? And Kelly comes over, and she's like, hi, nice to meet you. So friendly, right? I was like, man, this is awesome. People are nice here, you know? And then she's like, so are you brand new? We're like, yeah, just moved to the area. We, uh, we live in Willard. Oh, yeah, where? Huff I Highway O. She's like, right before the bend, Robin Blue Egg Door. <laughs> Now, being a city kid, if people know where you live, you're like, yo, back up off. Why are you all up in my business, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's where we live. And then I realized everyone in the church knew our house. And I was like, this is crazy. We're known here. Like, we just moved. And we never visit another church. We've been here ever since, three and a half years. We love this church. This church has been good to us. It's been good to our kids. Brighton Assembly, you're an amazing church. Um, you made this city kid, originally from the Northeast, feel comfortable in a, in a setting that wouldn't be what I would call familiar to me. But I've been embraced here. I've been loved here. You let me park cars during the, the, the fireworks event, right? Uh, God of our fathers. I remember showing up, talking about being in it. I showed up to park cars. I thought I was parking cars in, in, in the pavement. I'd never been to the event before. I show up. I got shorts and flip-flops on. And they go... What are you doing with those? And I was like, what do you mean? Flip-flops are like, you trying to park cars in that? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you realize you're going to be in the fields back there, right? And then one of the guys, I don't even remember who it was, he was like, you better not step in the cow patty. Like that. And I was like, is this a thing I have to be concerned about? And then someone else walks up to me and they go, flip-flops, boy. You about to get some chigger bites. I was like, what are chicken bats? I don't know what that is, right? Man, you guys embrace me well. So let me explain why I say all that. Jesus is on a journey with his disciples. He takes them to a place, and he's about to unfold an idea of something there's no way they could understand because it's the first time Jesus even said the words. And so he takes them to a place to not just tell them about what's about to happen, but let them experience what's about to happen so that they get it. Does that make sense? And I want to take you into their journey so that you'll experience what Jesus is trying to say to us whenever we hear that he's trying to build a church. So with that being said, let's go to Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 13 through 18. And it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome it. So Jesus and his disciples, they leave a town called Bethsaida. They go on a 32-mile journey to a town called Caesarea Philippi. Today, if you were to go to Israel, Caesarea Philippi is now known as the Golan Heights. But at that time, during Jesus' days, quiet Siri, during Jesus' days, um, that place was called Penaeus, okay? And... Peneus was named after a god in Greek mythology named Pan. And here's why this is significant. I want to show you a picture of Pan. He's a Greek god that they worshipped. He's this half man, half goat being. And um, there's no temples built to him. 
because he's a God of nature and outdoorsy stuff. Um, if you were an avid hunter, like that would have been your God back then, right? And so they, uh, they worshiped him in caves. They were outdoorsy about their worship, right? And so Pan is this, this God that they sacrifice to, the God of wooded rustic areas. He's also the God of music, and we have an instrument named after him. It's called the Pan Flute. He's also the God over fear and fright, and we have a word we use in everyday English because of him. It's called the word panic. And so all of that came because of this Greek God, Pan. And Jesus takes his disciples on a 32-mile road trip, stops at Panaeus, a place where Jesus is not known, he's not worshipped, in order to unpack one of God's great ideas, which was to create a community known as the church. A community so strong and so resilient that he says even the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Now, the city gate, because when we hear this, I know for a long time when I would hear this in church, I imagine like what Jesus is saying is that like the actual physical gate of hell can't prevail against the church. But I think there might be something else going on here. What you have to understand is at this time, the city gates is where the elders of the city met to have their meetings, okay? And so what's going on, I think, is Jesus is saying, as this reference to the gates of hell, is he's saying there isn't any authority in hell, any evil governmental power that can stop this community I'm about to create called the church. In other words, say it this way, the leadership of hell cannot do anything to negatively impact the expansion of the church. Hell cannot slow it down. Because Pastor Brent doesn't build the church, I don't build the church, Pastor Mike doesn't build the church, Jesus builds the church. We do the work, but he builds it. And listen, in case you don't know this, I just want to, it's in our songs we sang today, that the enemy is a defeated foe. He's not in power. I, a lot of us don't know that. I've gone to testimony services when I was growing up. Some of you maybe not know what a testimony service is, but for those of us that grew up in the church and have been there a long time, it was some, typically a Sunday night service. They would have an open microphone, which sometimes can be scary in Pentecostal churches. You don't know what you're going to get, right? <laughs> and people would just walk up to the mic, and, and they're supposed to testify about what the Lord's been doing in their life. But a lot of testimony services, they get up there, and they'd just be like, well, the devil, he just beat me up this week. <laughs> He'd been punching me across the face, one side and down the other, and bless God. That's the testimony. And I'd grow up, and I'd be like, well, it sounds like the devil's really strong, and Jesus ain't doing nothing, right? And how many of you know that's not really true, right? I mean, when we, we celebrated Easter that Jesus rose from the grave, what did Jesus defeat when he rose from the grave? It wasn't just death. It was the devil, and Jesus is now the king. We sing it all the time, but he's our king. He's in charge. He's in power. He has all the authority. He even says it as he's ascending into heaven. All authority in heaven and on earth now belongs to me. So he's in charge. So let's not give the devil more power than he has. Does that make sense? And also, side note, oh gosh, I almost killed myself. <laughs> Woo! Man, that's dangerous right there. These corners are sharp, bro. I'm going to get some sandpaper and like that. Side note here. Um, never mind. I forgot the side note. <laughs> Ain't that important. The point is this. The leadership of hell cannot do anything to stop the expansion of the church. But I want you to notice, Jesus doesn't say that I will build my synagogue and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. He says, I'm going to build my church. Now, here's why that's important. Because church isn't a word the disciples would have been familiar with. Synagogue, they would have known. They're good Jewish guys. They go to the synagogue. They worship. They understand. When Jesus says church, the disciples don't have a framework for that. They're like, wait a minute. You're going to make what? What are you saying? And Jesus specifically uses this Greek word called ekklesia. Everyone say ekklesia. Ecclesia is a Greek word, okay, and it was made popular by the Romans. 
It was a gathering of people called out and separated from the rest of the city that met to participate in legislation, declare war, make peace, negotiate treaties, make alliances, and elect officials. The Roman ecclesia would often gather around their emperor or king to hear and record his words. They were also responsible to make sure his desires and decrees were being implemented all over the kingdom. Some theologians and scholars in certain commentaries say that uh, even it's believed that when Caesar, after giving his instructions to his Roman ecclesia, would then say, go into all the empire and give them the good news. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So here's what I want you to get. The ecclesia was a group of called out ones who were invited to hear the king's voice, know the king's heart, and declare the king's message throughout the kingdom in order to reproduce the king's culture throughout the empire. And then Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, I'm going to build that. So the modern understanding for us right here this morning is simply this. The Christian community we call the church is a group of people who are called out and invited to meet with the king in order to hear his voice, know his heart, and declare his message to the whole world in order to reproduce his culture in our schools, workplaces, neighborhoods, and cities. That's the church. Here's what that means. I know it gets confusing because we use terms almost like interchangeably. So what we call Brighton Assembly is we call it a church. We're going to church. And although that's what we call it, I think the phraseology has created in us the understanding that in order to be the church and to do church means we just have to assemble on a Sunday morning, sing songs, hear a sermon, and then go about our week. And although that's part of church, that is not the church. When we do church that way, here's what we do. We say, number one, Pastor Brent, you do all the ministry because you're the guy who's been trained. You know the words to say. You know how to preach sermons. I didn't go to Bible college. They didn't teach me this stuff. So I come and you do the work. And that's me being the church. Wrong. Or we say, okay, I'll be the church because I'll come to church on Sunday. I won't just absorb. I'll help. I'll go serve in the nursery. And although we need that, because my kids wouldn't, wouldn't help me learn here if there wasn't people to take care of them and teach them, like Pastor Clayton, who I'm so thankful for, and my kids adore, okay? Like, literally, we leave, and like, I'm pretty sure they like Pastor Clayton as much as they like me. I'm almost positive. Um, and my kids love it here so much. Like, when we have to travel to go speak at another church, they're like, you mean we don't get to go to Brighton today? And I got to be honest, like when you get to travel and speak at other churches, you see what other churches do. And like our kids program does an amazing job compared to, we've been to churches where they're like, oh, you have kids? Um, we got a teenager we can throw in a room with them. We're like, you know what? We're good. We're good. <laughs> you know, we'll take care of it. Um, but serving in the nursery, although it is part of serving and helping, you're still not being the church. And my concern is if we think that is the church, there's a whole segment of our world who will never come into this building, who will never hear the name Jesus. And those people exist. As a matter of fact, in our culture, in America, let me tell you this, this is a fact that has been tracked and verified by many studies the amount of people with each generation willing to even come into a church building is decreasing. Many sociologists are saying their generation, only 9% are open to coming to this building. They're open to Jesus. They're open to God. They're open to the supernatural. They're not open to coming to a building. And if being the church means putting all of that on Pastor Brent's shoulders, he's going to have a panic attack. 
because he can't reach Brighton and Willard and Bolivar with just him and the staff team. And if that's our expectation, number one, they'll never live under that. They'll never be good enough. And second, and which is the most disappointing, it gets all of you off the hook for doing what Jesus said you have to do. He didn't say, hey, qualified pastors and Bible college graduates, go make disciples of all nations. He said, all my followers go make disciples of all nations. That means there's no spectators in the house. You don't get to sit on the bench and let the paid staff do the work. You got to be out there making disciples. Oh, but Josh, I like, wh where do I even do that? Wherever you are. Wherever you are, you are the missionary to the people around you. So at your school, you're a missionary. Go reach people for Jesus. It doesn't mean you got to stand on the tabletop in the cafeteria, because you might be like me and be like, can you kill me? I don't want to do that, right? But it might mean that you don't go to math class without a purpose. And your purpose isn't getting the grade. It's reaching people in your class. The grade's secondary. For college students, it might mean you're at school to get a degree, but your degree is less important as reaching people for Christ. And so if you have to go part-time to reach people, then that's what you do and go five years. Adults, the only reason I even have family that's saved is because my dad, who worked in a machine shop, had a guy by the name of David Gardikis who walked into the machine shop and said, I'm the missionary of this machine shop. And he didn't stop until a bunch of tool and die makers gave their hearts to Jesus. Because that was his mission field. You are the missionary wherever you are. And that's what it is to be the church. That's what Jesus said when he said, I'm going to build a church. He didn't say he's going to build this, although that's part of it. He said, I'm going to build a movement that reaches and changes nations and cities. So Brighton Assembly isn't done until everyone in Polk County is saved. And then if you do that, you might as well move on to Greene County. Because they need Jesus too. Lord knows they need Jesus. I believe that when Jesus said he's going to build his church, what Jesus had in mind had less to do with gathering a large assembly into a building and had more to do with taking his mindset and his message into our communities until our communities look like his kingdom. It's doing your normal jobs with a kingdom purpose. It doesn't mean that Melissa has to quit education and become a pastor. That might be the worst thing you could do because you already have influence in the education system. It means that every day when you walk into your school, you go, Jesus, what do you see here? And how can I make a difference? right? I told our first service crowd, in case you're a senior in this room, this isn't something you ever get to retire from. You might get to retire from your job. You don't retire from the kingdom. So when you're like, well, what do I do? I'm tired. Find a young person to invest in. Because a lot of my generation doesn't have dads. A lot of my generation didn't have their moms present because they're working two jobs because they're single moms trying to support multiple kids. And so we're like, who is the people who will invest in us? And I'm so thankful for older men like Joe Stuckey from my, my church growing up. This old man, I'd walk into church and he'd look at me and he'd say, listen, Mr. Josh, you know what? There's only two tough people in this church and I'm both of them. <laughs> but that man took me under his wing every Sunday morning. And he was like, I believe in you, son. You know how powerful it is for a guy who doesn't have his dad to have an old man in his 60s put his arm around him and say, I believe in you, and you have purpose, and you were made for destiny. All of a sudden, you go, I can do something. A lot of these kids, they just need older saints to put their arm around them and be moms and dads. All of us have a purpose. So this is what it is to be the church. But I also want you to see something else Jesus says. He says, I'm going to build it on a rock. He doesn't say, I'm going to build it in a valley or on a hill. I'm going to build it on a rock. Now, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, we've gotten into arguments for a long time over the meaning of this specific verse. 
And so the Catholic Church has said, here's what we think it means. Jesus is talking to Peter, and Peter's name is Petra, Petros, which means rock or stone. So Jesus is saying to Peter, Petros, flesh and blood did not reveal the truth of who I am, but the Spirit of God did. And upon you, Peter, I'm going to build my church. And so they believe that this verse is all about Peter becoming the first pope, the first leader of the church. And Protestants for years have been like, boo, you Catholics, wrong. Let me just throw something out there. They're not all the way wrong. When the book of Acts happens in chapter 2, it says that the Holy Spirit is poured out and all these people come to Jesus. Thousands. Who's the first one to stand up and lead them? Peter. He literally is the first leader of the church. And so it's not necessarily wrong. But as our reaction to that, we have said as Protestants, we're like, well, that's not what it means. Here's what it means. When Peter says that you are the Christ, it's the, the rock of that truth that if we say Jesus is the Christ, he'll build his church on that. I'll be honest, I really love that definition too. I think it's really good. And I think Protestants probably have that right as well. So instead of fighting each other, maybe we could just be like, hey, both of us have some good points here. But I wonder if there's maybe even a third interpretation. I don't claim this to be scholarly. This is something that I've studied personally, and I call it the Josh Sousa interpretation of the passage. So if it's off, I'm a human. I screw up, okay? You know, Jesus has taken the disciples to this place called Penaeus. And right there in Penaeus is Mount Hermon. In order to understand what Jesus is saying, I think we need to understand how important Mount Hermon is at this time. Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain in modern-day Syria. On one of the sides of the mountain is a large cliff, and in the cliff is a cave. You can actually go there today. I'm going to show you a picture of it. So this is Mount Hermon right here, um, and this is where Penaeus is, and many scholars and, and theologians believe like that spot right there outside the cave is where Jesus is sitting when he's talking to his disciples. And if you notice on the far left, that big opening, that's, that's called the Cave of Pan. That's where the worship of Pan took place. I can't go into the details about the kind of worship, because as I did the study, it's so grotesque and vile, I don't want to share about it in a, in a setting like this. It's foul what they would do to worship this God. But if you notice, there's all these cutouts in the rock. That's where they would put idols and they would smear blood from their sacrifices on the walls of the cave. If you saw this in full color, you would see that it's stained even slightly red to this day. And because of all the evil that would happen there in the cave of Pan, people that didn't worship Pan from the outside, they, would, they considered that place hellacious. It was, it was like, you don't go there right? No one goes there to hang out or have conversations. Definitely not to take their teenage disciples on a field trip, okay? <laughs> Every youth pastor would be fired if they did what Jesus did here, okay? Through the Cave of Pan is part of the Jordan River, and so some believed that if you rode the Jordan River through the Cave of Pan, you were actually entering through a gate of hell to the underworld. And Jesus is sitting at the gate of hell, with his disciples. And he's like, who do you think I am? And they say, you're the Christ. And he's like, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but the Spirit of God did. And I want to tell you something else. Upon the rock, upon this rock, I'm going to build a church, a community that transforms the nation and the world. And not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. I think all of a sudden when you say that and the disciples are sitting there and they can smell it and see it, take it all in, they're like, wait, we're going to build a church here? You know how dark this place is? And I think that's exactly where the church needs to be. Because it's in the darkest places that the light shines the brightest. We can't avoid dark places and being the church. We can't just always go where it's safe. We can't try, let me say it this way, we can't try and take already converted people and make them a part of our community and call that success. And I tell you, the reason why I can say that is because that's how I pastored for years. In Indianapolis, 
in a city where the churches that thrive are mega churches and you have to be the latest and greatest and the best. I fell into that trap. We did lights, we did fog machines, we had high tech stuff, we, we tried to be as cutting edge with our worship as possible. We did all of that stuff. And you know what? Our church grew. We started a church and, and had very few people and 13 years later had three campuses, 800 in attendance on weekends. And can I tell you what also was true? Every Sunday after service, I met visitors in our guest room and I heard the same story week in, week out. How did you show up here? And they said, well, we were at our last church. We weren't being fed. We were at our last church and we didn't really care for the worship. We were at our last church and don't really like the pastor's preaching. And so we've come here. And so my church was growing, but it was only because other churches were closing. I was getting more fish from other ponds instead of adding fish to the pond. Does that make sense? And I sat down with our administrator and I said, I'm just curious, how many people have we baptized this last year? And she said, five. And let me tell you, with a church of 800 people and three campuses, we had a very large budget. We spent a lot of money to do ministry and we baptized five people. And then I go speak at a Chi Alpha Fall retreat where they baptize 12 students. And that was just one of three baptism services they'll have that year. And I look at Andy and I go, what do you guys operate on? I was not prepared for him to say less than 40K a year. I'm like, how can they, with no money, change this many lives? And we have million dollar budgets and we baptize five people. Maybe I'm not doing church right. And the problem wasn't my church. The problem was their leader. I had to change. And the only way I was going to change was to get out and learn something different. And so God brought me to Chi Alpha. And I learned what it is to make a disciple. Something that I think I could have told you before, but I would have given you a Bible college textbook answer on how to do discipleship. And what I learned was the in and out the grime of day in, day out, living life with people one-on-one -on -one and in community and on mission to transform people. And so my life is Chi Alpha now. I'm bought in. I'm, I mean, hook, line, and sinker. Like, I, I love what we do. But God says that the darkest places need the brightest light. And let me tell you what, the, what the, one of the darkest places is for me. It's my home city of Indianapolis. It's a million people surrounded by I-465. We have six universities and almost no campus ministry. And when I look at that, I say, that's a problem. And the Lord says, you're right. But it's a problem that I've called you to fix. Those are your people. That's your city. Go do something about it. And so Danny and I, here's what we're praying for and believing for. We're calling it Project 465. It is for us to go to our first assignment, which is IUPUI, which probably many of you have never heard of. And that's okay. Everyone in Indy's heard of it. Most of the locals go there. 30,000 plus students. Almost no campus ministry. They're lost. They're as far from Christ as you can imagine. Whatever you think you've heard about the university, how like, you know, oh, bad things happen to the university, take all that and you're right. That's IUPUI. And then urbanize it. It's a challenging context to plant in. It's going to be very difficult, but we're equipped to go do it. And so we're going to go and we're going to plant Kai off at IUPUI. We're going to raise up a healthy ministry, start an internship program, and start developing teams to then go and plant every other campus in the city of Indianapolis. And then we're going to ask all of our graduating seniors to consider staying committed to Indianapolis. Not to Archi Alpha, but to Indianapolis. Get marketplace jobs, I don't care, but get them in the city. And then I want you to move as teams of eight to ten people 
into strategic neighborhoods in the city. And I want you to do for your next door neighbor what we taught you to do for students on campus. And as you start to reach your neighbors for Christ, churches will automatically break out. Because you can plant a church, here's what I learned, you can plant a church and maybe not make a disciple. But if you'll make disciples, you'll always end up with a church. And so the goal for Project 465 is every campus, every neighborhood, to have a spirit-filled, disciple-making community in it. We're crazy enough to think the Lord's going to let it happen. And we're going to give our lives to it. And Brighton Assembly, I just want you to know, because of your investment in us, you guys support us. You guys have been our church family. You have invested in our kids. Some of you have been their nursery workers and children's care, children's church workers. Many of you have, have embraced us when we were leading worship here. Anything we do in Indianapolis is also attributed to you for your investment in us. And so we love this church. We love you. We love what we're about to do for the kingdom of God in the city of Indianapolis. But now it comes back to you again. I want to ask John and Macy and worship team to come up. And can you guys specifically go to the God of Revival song? What are you going to do? Because listen, I can preach a message. You can get all kinds of goosebumps and be like, ooh, that was, that was an inspiring word. But if you don't go do anything, it doesn't mean squat. So my, my question, and I'm going to personalize this. My question is now that you understand what Jesus meant when he said, go be the church, what are you going to do to transform Bolivar? Like, are we going to say, we want to reach Bolivar, or are you going to, like, go do it? And I don't mean, go do it. I mean, go do it. What are you going to do to reach Willard? And all the groves. God's calling you to go do something. So would you stand to your feet? We sang this song earlier in worship. And I love this part. Talking about use us to transform the city. I want us to sing that part. I know when I'm singing it, I'm going to be thinking about Indy. But when you're singing it, you need to be thinking about your neighborhood and your community. And say, Lord, what will you use me to do to transform where I live? where I work, where I go to school. All right, let's sing.